Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me for Choppy Lunch. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to be presenting today uh, something that I'd worked on uh, just before I joined my PhD and uh, a part of research that got published recently and um, connect that to some of the ongoing PhD research that I'm doing currently. Uh, globally, ecosystems are being transformed uh, rapidly for human sustenance and uh, currently over 40% of the global land area is covered by croplands and pastures. Uh, the amount of natural ecosystems to be transformed uh, in the next coming uh, few decades for agriculture is predicted to increase substantially. Uh, to counter the impacts of uh, land use change on species persistence, uh, land has been brought under protection and it has pr uh, protected areas have been considered as a successful conservation strategy uh, to provide refuge to several species of conservation importance. Um, currently, a recent assessment on uh, global range contraction on 25 large carnivores has shown historic crop loss, uh, historic range contraction uh, between 77 to 99 percent for some of the endangered species. Uh, carnivores are uh, require large home ranges and high prey biomass and these bio biological traits uh, make them highly susceptible to uh, habitat loss and fragmentation. Uh, some of the areas which are predicted to be uh, high priority, high landscape, uh, landscape susceptible to uh, range contraction are those with high densities of people, livestock and area under cropland. <coughs> Uh, in many of the high priority areas for large carnivore conservation, uh, the people who suffer the most because of predators are the ones who, are, uh, who can least afford it. Uh, they're stuck in cycles of poverty traps and rely heavily on assets such as livestock. Uh, conservation, conservationists around the world are increasingly looking at for approaches that can uh, benefit both people and um, wildlife. Uh, different financial mechanisms and methods have been adopted worldwide, uh, including compensation and insurance schemes uh, for losses due to predator presence, uh, revenue sharing models providing uh, monetary benefits to people uh, through ecotourism or community-based ecotourism or homestays, or conservation uh, payments through programs like easements. Uh, but none of these approaches by themselves uh, are a panacea for issues related to conservation issues, uh, conservation problems, and uh, come with their own set of operational issues, whether it's distributional inequi inequities or transactional costs. Um, any conservation intervention uh, needs to work towards offsetting direct costs of carnival presence, and at the same time, developing methods that uh, would help provide net benefits associated with carnival presence. Uh, one of the countries recognized as a high priority area for large carnivores is, uh, is India. Uh, and I'll <coughs> briefly introduce um, you to India. Um, it's, uh, it lies a couple of degrees north of the equator and the tropical climate is mostly driven by its topography. Uh, it's flanked by the Himalayas in the north and surrounded by the ocean on three sides. And um, this uh, climatic variation results in varied forms of habitats ranging from uh, rainforest, tropical rainforest to coniferous forests, uh, grasslands, deserts, mangroves, etc. Um, India is recognized as one of the 17 mega diverse countries in the world and 23% uh, of the global carnivore species occur in India. Uh, however, this natural wealth is juxtaposed against the reality of over a billion people. Um, we, ha we have been one of the fastest growing economies in the world except for the last one year where we're just crashing down. Uh, 
agriculture contributes nearly 14% to continues to uh, contribute 14% of india's gdp and employs over 40% of the workforce um 20% of the global poor are in india and while we have a high literacy rate of 75% we also have a really high dropout rate uh in given this contradiction of a lot of biodiversity living amidst a lot of people uh, the government has over the last few decades uh, afforded protection to some of the threatened ecosystems and uh, wildlife by creating a network of national parks wildlife sanctuaries and reserves uh, given the fact that over almost 20% of india is forested less than 5% of it is actually under the protected area network uh, also these reserves these protected areas are extremely small highly isolated and fragmented the landscape surrounding the protected areas is extremely heterogeneous comprising of agricultural areas and multi use forests uh, which are used uh, for grazing cattle uh, collection of non timber forest products for uh, fuel wood etc which uh, provide which support the livelihood of millions of people uh, studies have also documented the occurrence of an entire guild of carnivores occurring in these human dominated landscapes uh, some of these landscapes act as things connecting to two or more source populations or sometimes they accommodate spillover individuals such as sabadash transients from adjoining forests uh grasslands which is a highly underrepresented ecosystem uh, or habitat in our protected area network um they support carnivores such as wolves and agricultural areas especially sugarcane or maize they support or provide refuge to uh, breeding individuals uh, tigers and leopards uh wildlife presence in human dominated landscapes it results in losses for both wildlife and people and um for many marginalized farmers who are subsisting primarily on incomes from agriculture or animal husbandry uh, these res uh, losses result in antagonistic attitudes towards uh, wildlife and conservation in general uh as a case study a uh, leopard is one of um, an important species to study in human dominated landscapes because it's one of the most versatile versatile and adaptable species occurring in nearly 68% of india's land area uh, it's wide ranging habit ha uh, habit and a uh, high overlap with human dominated landscapes uh, makes it highly prone to conflict with people uh, either through retaliatory killing by the people or removal and translocation by state authorities uh, studies have also shown that life uh, domesticated livestock and feral dogs are a primary prey for leopards in human dominated landscapes and it has been shown that they've contributed to human well-being through this disease mitigation and agricultural production uh, we tested some of these claims by asking the following questions um Firstly, what is the influence of landscape features and uh, wild uh, wild prey abundance on leopard distribution? Uh, secondly, what are the determinants of livestock or human attacks by leopards? Uh, third, what's the role of wild prey in their diet? And finally, to what extent is wild prey able to offset livestock depredation? uh to answer this question we worked in a particular area uh that's the map of india uh the state the central state which literally trans madhya pradesh which literally translate to central state uh and in the southeastern <coughs> corner we worked in a landscape covering about 10000 square kilometers uh it's a, a forest landscape connecting two major protected areas kanha and penj and the landscape is basically a uh, mixed and dry deciduous forest in interspersed with agricultural land um we divided the area into a grid network of about 52 square kilometers keeping in mind the home range size of leopards and within these each of these grids we uh, conducted indirect sign surveys looking for scats and bug marks and um 
At the same time, we also conducted household surveys. The landscape is uh, home to about 400 villages or nearly 300,000 people. Uh, so we conduct, conducted household surveys, talking to people about their experience uh, related to uh, depredation, livestock depredation. Uh, we uh, uh, adopted an occupancy modeling approach and we were able to identify uh, hotspots of leopard occurrence in the landscape. And what we found was that forest cover and wild prey abundance were what were driving leopard distribution. And uh, they actually avoided large human settlements. Uh, there was a negative relationship between the size of the human settlement and leopard occurrence. Uh, similarly, we adopted, we uh, mapped the conflict hotspots in the landscape as well, and we were able to see where uh, the probability or the risk of conflict was the highest. We found that livestock or cattle holding uh, at the household level uh, positively influenced conflict, uh, probability of conflict, and also the occurrence of leopards themselves, which, is, uh, which was a result we got from the previous analysis and we found that anthropogenic disturbances uh, had a negative effect. So actually areas with high disturbance um, was where leopards were not actually in conflict with areas with low disturbances. <coughs> uh, we also analyzed almost 250 scat samples to study the diet content uh, of leopards and what we found was more than 90% of the biomass comprised of uh, wild prey, uh, such as ungulates and uh, primates, and domestic livestock and dogs comprise less than 3% of uh, leopard diet in this landscape. And these results mirrored our results from the occupancy survey as well, which showed a positive relationship between a uh, positive relationship for wild prey in terms of driving leopard occupancy. Um, Despite the fact that uh, livestock is widespread in this landscape and uh, it occurs at really high density, one of the reasons why probably wild prey is still a large part of leopard diet could be because of high prey availability in this landscape compared to uh, other human dominated landscapes in India. Um, we also ran some simulations and hypothetical scenarios. Uh, given that wild prey in terms of uh, can decline in future because of uh, habitat loss, subsistence hunting, or culling by wildlife managers to prevent crop raiding. Uh, we looked at future scenarios where wild prey could decrease by 25, 50, and 75 percent. And what we found was that um, because leopards are highly uh, they persist in human dominated landscapes either way and their diet could shift to domestic, domestic livestock and uh, in each of the scenarios we found that shift to take place and in the final scenario 75 percent decline we found that domestic livestock could comprise nearly 60 percent of um, life's, uh, leopard diet. Overall taken together what we see is that if the why uh, the wild prey abundance goes down because of habitat loss or culling by forest managers. The leopard uh, diet uh, would shift and would result in increase in livestock depredation. And if the leopard population decreases because of either retaliatory killing by people or removal by wildlife managers, incidence of crop raiding would increase. Either of these two scenarios would cause increased uh, economic losses to the people, not just to the people, but also to the state treasury, which dispenses hundreds and thousands of dollars every year to compensate for these losses. Uh, even though leopards, leopard is a very important species to study in the context of human dominated landscapes, uh, there's an entire guild of carnivores that persist here and they may not be as adaptable as leopards. Uh, and through our case study, while we were able to show that maintaining an ecological balance between leopard and wild prey could afford, uh, could provide economic benefits, it's uh, still a very notional idea and it needs to translate into something more tangible for the people. Uh, so the question that 
one wants to ask is in india in shared landscapes is there scope to have more participatory approaches uh, which provide a stake to people in conservation decisions are there way, ways to incentivize conservation which could help in expanding habitat for wildlife while at the same time uh, diversify existing livelihood options for the people and at the same time improve local communities attitudes towards um, carnivores in general and biodiversity uh, with this i delve into my phd research questions that i'm working on currently which is looking at patterns and drivers of habitat used by a guild of carnivores in these landscapes uh, secondly what are the factors that drive uh, the willingness of local communities to modify land use. First of all, are they even willing to change their land use uh, to something which is more wildlife friendly uh, if given a financial incentive? And if yes, then what are the factors that are driving that? And finally, uh, combine ecological, social and economic data into a framework which helps in spatial prioritization of landscapes for future conservation interventions. Uh, if you remember, a few slides ago, I showed you the Kanha Pench landscape uh, in central India. Uh, for my PhD research, I'm working in a subset of an area which is just in the buffer of uh, Pench uh, Tiger Reserve. This, so this is Pench and it has uh, the darker green area in the middle is the core area which is about 400 square kilometers and it's surrounded by a buffer area an administrative buffer of roughly 800 square kilometers where um, human activities like agriculture, resource extraction, etc., are allowed. Um, there's a highway, it's not very clear, there's a national highway which cuts through the buffer area uh, and I am working primarily on the west side of the national highway which is about 500 square kilometers. Uh, this landscape is again mostly multi-use reserve, uh, reserve forest, uh, government-owned plantations and monocultures, and uh, primarily private agriculture. Uh, the agriculture, the agricultural crops that are grown predominantly are wheat, rice, sugarcane, uh, maize, a variety of pulses and oil seeds, and it's. Um, a number of communities live here, including one scheduled tribe and several scheduled castes and government recognized uh, backward classes. Um, there's a whole assemblage of wild species that occur here, including tigers, leopards, sloth bears, uh, four species of canids, um, about eight or nine uh, ungulates, and two primates. Uh, the first part uh, to look at the habitat used by carnivores within this la landscape, again uh, using a grid based approach, uh, we divided the landscape into these grids and I deployed uh, camera traps in this entire landscape. Um, we deployed about 98 camera traps and in each grid the number of cameras that were deployed were proportional to the forest cover. Um, Got some very interesting photographs of sloth bears, uh, dholes, tigers, leopards, um, jackals, foxes, wolves. The one species that uh, we were not able to actually uh, uh, detect was the striped hyena. Uh, so, using the number of detections, the different detections from across the landscape that we've got, again, I would be uh, uh, using an occupancy approach to. Um, look at the habitat use patterns in this landscape. Uh, a combination of different predictors uh, will be used. So firstly, I'm looking at landscape metrics, such as the proportion of forest cover, uh, as well as the configuration of the landscape. So how fragmented is the landscape? How broken apart is it? How many forest patches are there? The edge density? Uh, what is the size of the largest patch in a particular area? So all of these different configuration and composition metrics would, uh, are being used. Um, next, uh, I'm also looking at prey abundance. So again, data from the camera trap uh, surveys itself uh, are being used to calculate uh, encounter rates with different species of prey uh, and different combinations of prey are being used uh, for each of the carnivores depending on their diet. 
uh, I'm also using different forms of anthropogenic disturbance, uh, such as extraction of fuel wood and timber, uh, non-timber forest products, the presence of free-ranging dogs in the landscape, as well as um, livestock grazing uh, in all of these areas. Um, <coughs> Uh, the next part of the survey was to look at the willingness of farmers. So again, uh, I conducted household surveys in the landscape. Uh, we met with a, uh, almost 600 farmers uh, across the entire landscape and spoke to them, um, discussed with them options related to adopting wildlife-friendly agriculture and also collected other demographic uh, information. Uh, so I had... Uh, I adopted a stated preference or a choice experiment approach. Uh, basically, uh, to each respondent, we show them a choice experiment card. Uh, so, for example, uh, they offered the first program A, which says that, okay, you restore 25% of your land for a period of 12 years at a payment amount of X amount of dollars per year. The second option that is being provided to you is you restore 50% of your land for a period of six years at uh, Y dollars per year. Between these two programs, would you like to choose any? Or the third option is that you don't have to choose anything at all. And this experiment is repeated with them multiple times, three or four times, to see what's actually driving their decision. Is it the amount of land that you've been asked to restore? the number of years that you're being asked to enroll on in a program or the actual payment amount that's been offered to them. So what's driving their decision essentially? Um, we also collected info, uh, demographic information such as uh, number of people in the household, uh, level of education, period of residency, how long have they been staying in the, you know, in the particular village uh, and ancestral ties, etc. Uh, information related to their perception towards biodiversity in general, risks associated with land use change, uh, community engagement, uh, their prior experience with NGOs or governments uh, in the village as well. Um, we collected information on economic factors such as uh, different sources of income that they have, not just from agriculture, but also from other um, livelihood sources, uh, the number of livestock that they own, uh, whether they've uh, received any benefits through ongoing tourism or not, uh, etc. Uh, and finally, we also got information related to their interactions with uh, wildlife. So one is how close is their farmland to uh, a forest patch or the distance from the protected area as well. And secondly, how frequently do they face incidents of crop breeding by different species or depredation by carnivores as well. Um, <coughs> finally, uh, to answer the question related to prioritization, uh, spatial prioritization in general basically uses ecological data on threatened species or threatened ecosystems and combines that with the costs of conservation itself. The assumption in this case is that the land is available for conservation through acquisition. Uh, but the reality is that in human dominated landscapes, it's uh, private land holding and land management decisions are governed by uh, the choices of individual landowners. So for any future effective implementation of conservation action, uh, the needs and willingness of private individuals is extremely important and it needs to be incorporated. Uh, it's also been shown that in studies where people are unwilling to engage, areas of high conservation priority are not the same as areas of high conservation opportunity. And uh, we've seen that the cost of spatial conservation is ex extremely different when the social context is ignored. And there's a huge gap that results in conservation targets and conservation fe feasibility. So increasingly spatial prioritization exercises are now adopting tools from uh, social sciences uh, to identify areas where conservation action can take place.
Uh, keeping that in mind, I'm currently working on developing a framework which basically uh, takes into account the knowledge of habitat used by a guild of uh, threatened uh, and endangered carnivores. Uh, at the same time, looking at the willingness of farmers to participate or collaborate in any future conservation interventions and um, look at different possible options uh, in the future to prioritize areas. With that, I would like to acknowledge all my committee members and co-authors on my study on leopards and uh, all the funding agencies, the forest department and the volunteers and field assistants who have been connected with this. Thank you. Got more of a natural history question. Um, I was surprised to see three tigers in the same camera shot. Is that normal? I always think of tigers as being more solitary. Yeah, that, that was a female tiger with, with two, two, with two cubs. Very big cubs. Yeah, they they with their mothers. The uh, female cubs stay up to eighteen months, eighteen months to two to three years almost. So and then they disperse. The male cubs disperse much earlier, uh, but yeah. They stay up to like two years or so. So this particular area was actually very close to the park boundaries, so we got a lot of pictures of the family of tigers. Yeah. Did you see <coughs> the presence of another animal will affect the tiger maybe a movement by in the same place? So uh, the analysis that I've um, Done as of now, I've uh, for in terms of occupancy, it's very widespread occurrence of all the carnivores, and there's very high spatial overlap uh, amongst all of them. Uh, there would be fine scale behavioral avoidance if that might be uh, at the scale of you know individual camera trap locations or something. Uh, what at the scale that I'm analyzing, which is uh, the grid is about 13 square kilometers, which is a really large. Um, area to see segregation among animals. Uh, so to see avoidance, um, there would be other analysis that would need to be taken uh, to be done to see competitive interaction. I follow up with the question I <coughs> study. I, I'm curious, and we have one of your co-authors. I'm curious the degree to which those results surprised you surprised other sort of government officials or local landowners? I mean, is that what you expected to find and, and how have those results sort of been disseminated or translated and how have they been received? Um, so yeah, initially the, the assumption was that we would find a lot of livestock or at least dog uh, remains in the, um, in the scat samples. Uh, but uh, even like while I was in field, um, the number of signs of wild prey everywhere was also really high. And uh, people also complain constantly about crop raiding by herbivores or primates. So uh, we know that prey abundance is high in that landscape. So there is a justification in terms of why the why lepers are not. Uh, you know, subsisting primarily on livestock. Um, in other areas, there are a couple of studies from India, uh, from purely agricultural lands or uh, human-dominated landscapes where the prey dense the abundance is extremely low, which is why the leopards are completely persisting on either just boats and dogs. Uh, so I think just the fact that there is prey available here, um, that shift has not happened. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the results were communicated to the forest department managers and stuff, but in India, they don't really look at papers or scientific results. Uh, so it's just an acknowledgement of, yeah, okay, you did this work under our, you know, we gave you permissions to do it and you submitted the results and beyond that. It doesn't really translate to anything. Um, so yeah, even though like the results were shared and spoken about, like it doesn't translate it to any management action immediately. 
um and um, yeah it's uh, yeah that's had commented about how like monkeys were a complete nuisance langurs and rhesus macaques were a complete nuisance there because they were causing so much of damage to their plantations and they were actually considering you know different approaches of culling and eradicating primates from there and i shared these results with them and i told them you let them be because that that was a feeling on them and, yeah <coughs> Regarding uh, those scenarios that you presented to people, like would you prefer the six year and the percentage and the 12 year? Like, do you have uh, any results on that? Because honestly, I thought I don't know what's inside. I wouldn't know what's inside. It's yeah. really hard. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, what would be the the advantages and the and the like uh, challenges in the either scenario? Right. So. Well, definitely people took a lot of time and like each interview would take like almost an hour in general, like asking all the different questions, but that was one of the sections which was the most time consuming. First of all, explaining it to them itself, because we had a lot of like, you know, you're not just saying, okay, restore 25% of your land. There's, you show them photographs of what the expectation is and, you know, what the whole deal of restoration and changing land use is, why uh, questions associated with that. And essentially, um, what we found, it's, I haven't analyzed the data yet, just from like field experience and like preliminary exploratory analysis. What I found was that the percentage of land to be restored was the driving factor, then the payment amount and the time was like completely inconsequential really. Uh, and a lot of people were interested in like, you know, they'd say, okay, fine, we'll try first with just 25% of the land. If it works, and then later on in the future, we could increase it to 50% or even 100%. But we would like to start with, you know, play a safe bet and start with only 25%. There were people, again, it shows like <coughs> there are different factors associated with it where people did acknowledge and want to go directly for larger percentages of land as well. Um, in terms of uh, the uh, the different like factors that come up, for example, like conflict comes up as a major uh, factor, uh, where people, you know, would be uh, had mentioned that they're already losing all of their uh, crop to wild herbivores, so they want different alternatives now, uh, which could provide them with some income because a lot of these farmers are subsistence farmers. Uh, so that's the only source of income that they have. Um, also, uh, an important, there are other contexts that are associated with it as well. Uh, for like, there's an ongoing agrarian crisis in India. Uh, so even though the government sets like minimum support prices uh, to give to uh, farmers against the crops that they grow, uh, a lot of these minimum prices do not reach the farmers uh, because of institu institutional setup and problems associated with that. So there are a lot of middlemen who are able to provide the money 
immediately rather than waiting for, a gov for the government to give you money three months later. Um, so there are a lot of uh, problems associated with fluctuating monsoons and drought because of which um, agriculture in general is, um, is now uh, as a source of livelihood or income, it's sort of like people are trying to move away from it as well. Also looking like migration becomes a major issue in terms of people wanting to leave the agrarian lifestyle, move to urban centers because it provides them with better opportunities for education, healthcare, uh, all of those things as well. So it's, there are a lot of factors in, as to why a person would choose to, um, you know, go for a program where they're restoring their land. Uh, and get paid for it. Well, as of right now, they're not making any profit. Um, yeah. Maybe I need to ask you, but how is the ownership or how much land is a cost? I think that seems like a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the whole idea for this, like, has been um, adopted from like this, the conservation easement programs that there in the US and Australia, and there are lots of different models across the world as well. But one of the most differentiating point is the fact that um, the land tenure system or the land holding in the developed countries or outside India in general is, is huge. In the US and Australia, it goes up to 500 acres per person uh, in India, at least in this landscape, the average land holding size is 10 acres per person. So even when we were initially thinking of like, you know, ideating about something like a conservancy approach that is there in, in Africa where, you know, people come together, communities come together and protect private land, have private wildlife reserves, all of that, something like that cannot work in India because the benefits would spread so thin because everybody has such a small piece of land holding. Um, so if you want to look at <coughs> conservation on private lands outside the existing protected area network, what is the way to, you know, bring those landowners on board? And the idea is not that, you know, beyond these protected areas, create forests and have wildlife walking around everywhere. It's not just that. Like I mentioned, like these protected areas are extremely small and fragmented. So across different protected areas, if the landscape in between, which is right now hundreds and hundreds of acres of just monoculture, rice and wheat that's growing, if there's um, slightly wildlife friendly agriculture that's pra being practiced there, it just reduces the resistance across the landscape for wildlife to move across. And, and creates like, you know, stepping stones across a much larger landscape. So it's not just, you know, envisioning like taking away land of people and um, just growing forests in those areas. And of course, those comments also came up during interviews where, you know, people said, oh, you're just trying to acquire your, our land and make it into a forest. And then the forest department will remove us from these areas because there's animals. So a lot of those conversations also happened. Um, to look at, you know, what's the best best case scenario and what can be worked out. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much for your time.